All right, so our speaker tonight is Dr. Isabel holland Bulix. She's an assistant professor of anthropology and climate science at Penn State University. She's the director of the Socio-Ecological Histories of Estuarine Landscapes Lab, or the Shell Lab, with her primary research program focusing on human environmental dynamics in the U.S. Southeast by way of paleoenvironmental reconstruction via zooarchaeological analyses of vertebrates and, and, and invertebrates, stable isotope analysis of marine shell, and chronological modeling of anthropogenic exploitations of estuarine environments. So, Isabel, thank you again so much for joining us. And um, let me stop sharing and I'll let you take it away. Excellent. All right. All right, we good? Does it look good? We're good. All right, perfect. Um, thank you all so much for being here today and having me. Um, and thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. Um, talk today is titled Localized Histories of Calusa Ecology and Economy in Southwestern Florida, about 81,000 to 1,500. Um, and yes, I'm an assistant professor of anthropology and climate science at Penn State in the Department of Anthropology. Um, I will do a little shout out. I am currently recruiting um, great graduate students and potentially postdocs in the near future. So if you are interested and are interested in this talk, um, please contact me. Um, so let's go through a little bit about what you can expect out of this talk today. Um, first, I'm going to talk about how I go about investigating environmental change and indigenous economies, basically how I think about these things, um, and also about socio-ecological systems in the U.S. coastal southeast. Um, then I'm going to talk about two more specific case studies. Um, it, regarding the Calusa in southwestern Florida, specifically sociological hi socioecological histories and zooarchaeological indicators of environmental change during the Little Ice Age, and then engineering estuarine ecologies and surplus production at Mount Key um, during the Little Ice Age. Um, I can do a little bit um, of talking about some of our future directions um, in southwestern Florida, and then I'm happy to take any questions um, at the end. So my research really revolves around three separate but very interconnected research themes, um, one being the local manifestations of global climate change, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute, um, economic institutions, and the relationship between economy and ecology. And what I mean by economic institutions is really the organization of labor and practices that revolve around how people integrate animals in their communities. And so climate change, you know, can, it can change at a pace that's really relative to the human experience. And it changes on scales that directly affect local ecologies, which then in turn affects the distribution and availability of many different animal resources. And so this is especially true and, and is a problem for populations who live within estuarine ecosystems where sea level can change and act as a primary driving force in the configuration of these ecosystems. And so this is when it becomes really critical to understand the effects of this global climate change trends on local environments when we seek to understand past economies. And this is really more about trying to get at the human experience. And so what you see in this map here is, is all of these red, um, these red out areas on the map um, are, places where local or where environmental signatures have been used to explain cultural change in Florida. And so, you know, what we really need is to connect these different types of environmental signatures with our archaeological sites. And so problems then arise when we try to link when archaeological studies try to link long-term multi-centennial trends in climate change with the changing availability of resources because most global trends are developed in proxies far removed from our archaeological study areas, and this is especially the case in the U.S. Southeast. And so more specifically in doing so, what that does is it, one, assumes that global climatic trends affected regional and local environmental conditions uniformly. They don't. Um, in most cases. Two, it lacks information on how economic changes then articulate with local ecological conditions. And three, these local signatures continue to be largely misunderstood from an archaeological perspective. And so all of this then can cause a disconnect in our understanding of local animal populations and how people then experienced and dealt with environmental change over much shorter time spans. This is because these processes operate at a vastly different scale. 
Ultimately, this then leads to problems with our understanding of the exact context under which many of these coastal groups manage strategies for resource exploitation in the face of shifting ecologies. And so my research starts to address these issues by using data from archaeological sites to understand past ecological conditions, with the, which then can be directly tied to economic institutions within these communities. And so it's really important to understand the historicity of the relationship between people and their environments. These are not separate entities. And so in thinking about past human environmental interactions, past human climate dynamics, I don't presume the inherent separation between humans and ecosystems, but rather that humans are a part of their ecosystems, both biologically and socially, that's important. And the way in which they enculturate their environment can have really profound effects on local ecologies. Humans are not passive respondents to ecological change, but can be very active agents in changes that then occur within these ecosystems. And the landscape functions as a representation or rather material manifestation of these kinds of agency. And so additionally, when we think about these kinds of relationships, we have to take a perspective that allows for the examination of changes while acknowledging that there are um, non-human agents of change. Right? So these are operative processes, like the changes induced by global climate shifts that are beyond the capability of humans to maintain landscape continuity. So most consider the Holocene, right? the approximately last 10,000 years, as climatically boring, but we do know that there are actually fluctuations that impact the landscape and conditions always weren't ideal, which required the adoption of various strategies to deal with such fluctuations. And so really my research views these social and natural systems as, as coupled and bound entities that don't change linearly or deterministically. This perspective provides a way to understand human environmental interactions that recognizes the challenges of living in very climatically sensitive environments and that humans possess extensive ecological knowledge of the places they live and the ability to actively manipulate the environment to mitigate these changing conditions. And so this viewpoint then provides, provides a foundation to further empirically explore this intersection between socio-ecological and socio-political facets of these coastal communities. And so one of the things that I use is the zooarchaeological record. And so this is, um, this is the remains of animals found at archaeological deposits. And so this can tell us about ecological conditions because organisms occupy very distinct geographic distributions spatially, and these distributions can change through time as ecological conditions change. You can connect the data that you get from the archaeological record to changes in environmental conditions, and so here I use salinity as a limiting factor. So when salinity regimes shift, Organisms can respond via relocation, different types of reproduction practices or behaviors, or other altering other different types of behaviors to adapt to these new conditions. However, while these resources can respond, humans can also alter their economic strategies to either follow resources where they relocate, adopt alternative types of resources, um, or adapt or alter their collection practices to best fit these new ecological conditions or they can invest in economic strategies that foster resilience in the face of ecological change. And it's this last strategy that requires really extensive knowledge of these ecological systems and the biological characteristics of the resources they use in order for these strategies to work. And so these are, I'll go through just very briefly some of the areas in the US Southeast that I have worked in investigating these types of relationships. So for example, on the Georgia coast, um, I have worked with looking at the overall long-term stability in oyster harvesting practices. And this is primarily via oyster morphometrics and stabilized top analysis. And so what we see that all is that although during the late archaic there was initial harvesting pressure that stabilized, um, and it, we actually demonstrated there's an increase in oyster size over time, indicative of increasing ecosystem productivity, which could either be through human management practices, environmental change, or likely both. Um, I've also done some work um, in um, sort of more northern Gulf Coast of Florida, um, where I was using stable isotope trends to, 
to look at seasonality, which is linked to site occupation, different site occupation patterns, mound construction, and changes to habitats from which oysters were collected. But um, today I really wanna to talk to you about some of my most recent research in Southwestern Florida. And so this is really looking at, again, this local manifestation of, of global climate change and the relationship to different economic strategies, both at the Pineland site in Charlotte Harbor and Mount Key down in Estero Bay. Um, approximately between the time period 81,000 to 1500. And this is, this is for really looking at this change um, in global climate regime from medieval warm period to the little ice age, which occurred approximately about AD 1200, 1250. Um, and both of these sites are ancestral Calusa sites. And so I'll talk, get more into who and what the Calusa um, what these Calusa sites look like. And all of the data that I present here is new data, um, both uh, radiocarbon analysis of Bayes Bayesian, with Bayesian statistical modeling, um, zooarchaeological analyses, and stabilized top analysis. So let's take a closer look at what um, this climatic shift looks like. And so the Little Ice Age, so this is circa 80, 1200 to 1850, is generally characterized as a time of relatively cool temperatures, glacial advances, and drying episodes. Um, this is really punctuated with periods of really high climatic variability. And so across the southeastern US, it, it appears conditions would have become generally cooler and drier with lower relative sea levels, which provided really a starting point for me to investigate some of these questions that I have and the impacts of these global trends in southwestern Florida. And so I will note too here, in relationship to fisheries that there's recent data on global fisheries um, that really suggest a causal link between changes in global climatic traditions and fisheries productivity in that um, fisheries can actually reflect changes that have occurred within the past one to two years. And so they're sensitive enough to reflect, you know, these the sort of annual decadal and multi-centennial scale change in environmental conditions. And so, um, the estuarine systems of the Florida Gulf Coast are actually very vulnerable, low-lying, shallow water ecosystems, right? With They have very small tidal ranges, um, and they're situated along a really long continental shelf. And so if you look up in the right, um, the top right corner of this map, in this image, um, the very light blue of this, the middle inset, um, is that low, shallow continental shelf. And what this means is that it's sort of any minor fluctuation in sea level can actually dramatically compound changes along the shoreline. These are really extremely productive ecosystems, however, they provide habitats for many different species. Um, and these systems trap nutrients and have year round photosynthesis. Um, based on some research by my colleagues, previous research, we know this area harbors a really long term record of co this cup these coupled socio ecological systems. Um, and so this really makes it an ideal location to investigate these trends in local ecologies and economies and these relationships. And so this is a potentially really sensitive, very dynamic environment with a long-term occupational history. And so back to salinity. And so again, for, for this research and that I'm doing here and presenting here, I really highlight the impacts is that changes in relative sea level impact salinity regimes because um, I, so I treat salinity as the limiting factor here to the location and availability of resources in these different environments. And so um, as sea levels fall, salinities decrease in the estuaries and marine conditions sort of contract seaward. Um, as sea levels rise, you have salinities increasing in the estuaries and marine conditions sort of expanding into the estuary. And that top graph in the in the on the right of your screen just demonstrates that there is a um, direct linear relationship between sea level rise and changes in salinity. So. Um, just I'll talk briefly about the Calusa. So there are few landscapes from around the world that were as intensively modified by fisher hunter gatherers as those in Southern Florida through canal systems, the creation of earthworks and the buildup of really massive mid and mound complexes along the estuarine bays and barrier islands. Calusa were non-agricultural, i.e. they participated in no maize or large scale row crop agricultural production. Um, primarily participating in fisher hunting and gathering. In the absence of maize, the Calusa then relied on aquatic resources, wild plant foods, and they also cultivated home gardens. So the absence of maize does not suggest that 
Um, there was no, you know, manipulation of plants. They are cultivating home gardens, just no participation in large, large agricultural production of maize. But given their reliance on these resources within these estuarine systems, right, ecological conditions then undoubtedly played a key role in both socio-political and socio-economic structuring and then restructuring of these communities. So they were organized as a, as a complex chiefdom or weak tributary state, really depending on, on who you talk to these days. Um, while the exact timing of the emergence of this kind of sort of political complexity is a bit unclear, we do sort of understand that we have a sort of chiefdom-like level of organization likely in place during the latter part of the first millennia AD. Um, and by the time of European contact in the 16th century, they controlled the entire lower third of peninsular Florida. Um, I will also mention that um, Pineland has the um, only identified chili pepper east of the Mississippi. Um, we also have papaya and gourds and, and preserved squash seeds as well. Um, so this is just really to, to orient you back on the landscape. I'm going to talk about um, first my research at Pineland. Um, so the Pineland site complex is located on Pine Island within um, the Charlotte Harbor estuarine system composed of Charlotte Harbor, Pine Island Sound, and San Carlos Bay. Um, freshwater input from um, a number of rivers, the Mayaka, the Peace, and the Caloosahatchee. Um, but the shape and location of Pine Island itself actually restricts a lot of freshwater runoff that, act, that makes it into Pine Island Sound, which means that Pine Island Sound really, um, its characteristic is most closely related to an oceanic bay where we have water at or near open ocean salinity. So it's very saline, um, but it's also very protected by this row of barrier islands off to the west. Um, it's also very shallow, only ranging between 0.3 and 0.6 um, meters in depth. So if we zoom into the site a little, um, Pineland harbors around a 1700 year span history of occupation. Um, we have two prominent mid and mound complexes that are bisected by a central canal, lots of water impoundment features and numerous other ridges and mounds, most likely all were in place by the onset of the Little Ice Age. Um, again, this is about circa 80, 1200. And so for, um, this research, I have data from a site that has extremely well-preserved ecological data. Um, the data that I have is from excavations conducted in 2015 and 2017 um, that revealed a partially waterlogged anaerobic shell midden. Um, we had really well-preserved stratigraphy, lots of waterlogged materials, um, which included cordage in long sections and knots, abundant burned and unburned plant remains and wood debris. Um, but also, as you can see, abundant shellfish and vertebrate remains. And so what's really important here is that I'll go back for a second, um, is that this is where, if you can see the cursor, um, that this deposit likely would have um, been located right along the shoreline at the water's edge. And so in order to establish the temporality of this deposit, um, I collected 19 radiocarbon dates, primarily on back black mangrove and then some pine and a saw palmetto. Um, if anyone is really interested in the Bayesian um, chronological model that I developed, I'm happy to talk about that. But the key here is that this accumulated somewhere between um, Cal 80, 950 to 1020 and Cal 1430 to 1500. So again, it captures that, that transition or that very early onset of the little ice age here. Um, and also what's really important is that this model estimates 30 year periods for each 10 centimeter level. Um, so extremely high sort of chronological resolution here. And so informed then informed by these radiocarbon dates, um, I analyzed four zooarchaeological samples that then tap temporally capture these first few centuries of the Little Ice Age. Invertebrates were screened to 16th inch to capture these much smaller shellfish species um, who are more sensitive to ecological conditions. Again, i.e. here that, that to me that means salinity and that's the limiting factor I'm using. Um, I'm using going to be using MNI or the minimum number of individual organisms as a quantitative measure to sort of discuss these changes in species abundance. Um, I always like to point out that I identified 36,000 um, specimens and estimated almost 19,000 um, 
individuals out of this. Um, I just love those numbers. So this um, sort of profile on the right here um, gives you an idea about where all the dates came from and then um, where the zooarchaeological samples came from as well. And so, yeah, so for the vertebrate environmental designations, I split up um, the bay into seven different environmental types that general represent the general salinity gradient within um, the sort of the Charlotte Harbor Pine Island Sound um, estuarine system. 70 to 80 percent of the total vertebrate MNI, so this would be all your basically primarily fishes, come from very saline, shallow water seagrass habitats, basically to your open ocean conditions. Um, but two of our earliest deposits actually have fish who prefer more saline waters. And so what we can then generally say here, potentially, is that we might see a shift in salinity and or potential economic practice sometime after about 1230 to 1255. So that, again, right around that change to Little Ice Age. And, and I will note here that these primarily are going to be sort of the indicators of economic processes because these are fish. These are likely economic fish. Um, and so then for the shellfish, what I did is I included only those taxa who are found in a single environment. And so um, this is, again, using those very general um, habitats that represent the salinity gradient throughout the system. Um, and so what we see here actually is a decrease in the percent of total taxa and percent MNI over time for those who prefer higher saline conditions and an increase in those who prefer less saline, which makes sense, right? Um, or more brackish condition waters. And so then it's not surprising that most of the fauna here are associated with very high saline seagrass meadows like those around Pine Island today. But these trends do start to suggest changes in the local ecological conditions because most of these species, right? So I, I screen these to 16th inch are not likely food species. And so if we look a little closely, um, so, so this is broken up into levels. 105 is the lowest and oldest, P1099 would be the, the uppermost or um, the most recent in time. And we see an inverse relationship between, for example, Eastern and crested oysters. Crested oysters prefer much higher salinities. And so they actually have much higher abundances in your older samples, whereas Eastern oysters prefer, have operate at optimal conditions between 15 and 30 parts per thousand, um, a bit lower than those crested, and they actually increase in individual numbers through time. All of these other species below those top two graphs are decreasing in abundance, and these species all prefer higher saline conditions. And so what does this mean? Um, so while we do see a slight change in species sometime between 81,000 to 1025 and 80, 1230 to 1255, we do see a more drastic decrease in species that prefer high salinities after Cal 80, 1230 to 1255. Now, what's very interesting is that it's during this time that the Central Canal, which is um, this canal, and this is an artist rendition um, of what it might've looked like with these many of these water impoundment features filled with water. Um, so this is the time that that canal was likely constructed. Um, this would have increased freshwater runoff right into Pine Island Sound. And so what we see here, we might have three different possible, possible factors that could influence these changes. One, we have a lower, lowering of relative sea level, two, increased rainfall, three, increased freshwater input, and all of which then affect local salinity regimes and probably all work together to, to create a combined effect on these local environments, which can only be understood by these environmental deposits. And so by depositing these middens along the shoreline, they created an environment attractive to many of these gastropod species. And in doing so, these provo deposits provide a resolution and environmental signature that is not normally captured in either completely natural deposits or other types of archeological deposits. We see changes in both fish species and economic, non-economic fish species. And so I have some future work actually aimed, up, aimed, at, line, aimed at lining up the timing of, of many of these major works more precisely with these local ecologies. 
right? So we know these economic bases are changing. So how does this relate to these sort of large public works? And so this is a great artist rendition um, by Merrill Clark, who did this for the Florida Museum, um, of what sort of the idea of this midden might have looked like, um, accumulating right on the edge of the shoreline. So let's let's move on down to Mount Key. Again, this is to, to orient you. Um, Mount Key is a 50, is located in Estero Bay. Um, I'll talk about environmental first. Um, Estero Bay is a shallow microtidal bay, um, generally considered a sub-estuary of that larger Charlotte Harbor system. Um, freshwater from a number of sources. Again, we're still in this sort of high salinity range and also very shallow. Depths average about one meter, um, can get up to three meters during high tide. So Mount Key is a 51 hectare anthropogenic island composed primarily of shell midden. And like Pine Island, excuse me, Pineland, is a, it's a very complex arrangement of midden mounds, canals, water courts, and many other features. And so by 81,000, the two largest mounds, which are mounds one and two, um, labeled on the map there, reach their pinnacle heights of about 10, meter, 10 meters and six meters respectively. Mound one contains a very large mound top structure with at least three phases of construction. Again, the top image is an artist's re rendition of that structure. And this is sort of this construction for an, an erection of this of the structure begins around 80, 1000. Um, and this likely served as the, as the seat of sociopolitical organization for the Calusa. And this is, a, this is what we see at the time of, at least at the time of, of Spanish contact. A large canal bisects these two mounds and extends across the entire island. And at the canal southern end, at the bases of mound one and two, we have two water impoundment features, which I will refer to for the rest of this time as water courts. And so our previous work demonstrates that they actually likely functioned as areas for storage of surplus live fish, which I'm going to get back to more in depthly in a minute. Um, so the people living here at Mount Key were likely the ones who met Ponce de Leon when he came to Florida. And so using the very established Bayesian radiocarbon chronology of the deposits at Mount Key, I chose 23 sampled contexts to do zooarchaeological analysis to target the time frame between 81,000 and 1,500. Um, most of these vertebrate remains are from bony fish, um, unsurprisingly, and so they represent about 80% of the total assemblage. Um, there's very high species richness and high in the species composition here suggests procurement from a very wide range of estuarine, both estuarine and marine habitats, um, which is then suggestive of a very productive local estuarine system. And so essential to Calusa's success, just as society's reliant on large scale agriculture was their ability to mediate changes to the location and availability of resources as the result of climate change via the collective organization and transformation of social, political, and economic institutions. And so our recent study demonstrated the capacity of the Calusa to intensify and formalize fish resource management through the creation of features to hold live surplus fish. And so it is these two features on this bottom left map um, labeled West Court and East Court. So especially critical for aquatic resources, the production of surplus fish requires adequate strategies for storage and food preservation, which has been explained as a mechanism to combat, to combat environment, environmental variability. Storage can take many forms, right? Drying, smoking, salting meat and fish. Um, the creation of large surpluses of resources here was likely a strategy that supported increasing political complexity that further differentiated already powerful house lineages and buffered against environment, shifting environmental conditions. But what this would have been very difficult in the subtropical and tropical temperature and humidity of Southwestern Florida, as I wish, as I'm sure you are all aware of. And so this really presents problems when it comes to storing um, surplus plant and animal remains. And so while we don't know the sort of specific water quality characteristics of these features, we do understand the hydrological capability of them to efficiently and effectively hold water. 
Our previous work demonstrates extensive knowledge related to architectural engineering within these landscapes. But what we, but what's also needed for these types of features to be successful is the knowledge of the biological and ecological consequences of these types of micro environments, as well as the bi biological and ecological thresholds for the fish that were held within them, right? So they're probably, I like to think of them as comparable to coastal lagoons, mini coastal lagoons, or rather shallow bodies of coastal water that are physically separated from open ocean conditions via a restricted inlet. So decreased exchange with more open ocean waters by both berm restriction and the location within the island of Mount Key itself could have limited water circulation and dissolved oxygen, oxygen content in and like maybe increased the nutrient content of these waters, um, these conditions could be potentially very stressful for many fish species. And so while they likely didn't reach levels of say eutrophication, they probably did create conditions stressful for the organisms residing in them. And so through an examination of these zooarchaeological samples I've looked at, we see a consistent reliance on a few fish worthy of further discussion. And so more specifically, these are two species of catfish, toadfish, mullet, sheep's head, and burfish. Um, previous research highlights the, the importance of mullet, but here I argue that there are other fish likely served very key roles as well. These fish have very high tolerances for a range of salinities. Most can tolerate waters in low dissolved oxygen. And so the ability of all these fish to endure varying environmental conditions likely played a large part in their preferential use within these courts. And so the choice to use such hardy fish demonstrates they really possessed intimate knowledge of the ecological, hydrological, and biological consequences of using water courts to create surplus stores of food, and thus chose species suited for the habitats that they created. Their presence in these samples from all time periods um, and from other Calusa sites demonstrates they're already familiar with these fish um, and they've been using them for a long time. So they knew what they were doing when they chose to intensively use them within these types of contexts. And so these water courts were constructed circa AD 12, 13, uh, 1300 to 1400. And so the next step now is to understand the local conditions associated with their construction and sort of how the Little Ice Age fits into all this here. And I will say that if anybody is interested, um, I can talk more about these burfish because they are, I have very, very high amounts and they're a particularly unusual fish. Um, so if, if interested, I can talk more about that, but I'll save that for now. So then to further investigate sort of these local eco ecological conditions, I have some preliminarily, I've preliminarily gathered some data, isotopic data from marine clams. Um, and so to evaluate these changing local environmental conditions and how they're tied to resource management, I um, sampled a series of paired radiocarbon dates, so three radiocarbon dates per shell throughout the organism's lifetime, and stable oxygen isotopic measurements from the same three shells. And so I have a total of nine new radiocarbon dates um, for that. Um, what's important here is that these shells represent a time period between Cal 80, 1100 and to 1500, um, and they capture the onset and use of the water courts is what's most important here. Again, if anybody is very interested in, in sort of the Bayesian modeling that I did with these, I'm happy to talk about it, um, but I'm going to move on. So um, I also on the same, again, the same shells, I gathered stable oxygen isotopic measurements um, and so these measurements record ambient water conditions, these shells, as they precipitate their shells as they grow throughout their lifetime. This is much like trees that lay down tree rings throughout their lifetime. And so this data provides a temporal framework. The radiocarbon dates provide the temporal framework for the stabilized tope analyses. And so hard clams precipitate all the shell material, right, at near the oxygen isotopic equilibrium with the ambient water conditions. And so they're recording the water, the water conditions. And so this is a function of evaporation rates, precip precipitation patterns, rates of terrestrial runoff. Um, all these things likely affect these local salinity signatures and regimes. And so even though there's a lot of variables that contribute to um, isotopic signatures, they still supply really meaningful tools with which to in interpret past environmental conditions. And so I collected um, 50 stable isotopic samples from 
um, the other half of the shell that was used for radiocarbon dating. So 50 samples a shell. And so what does this mean? Again, this is only three shells. This is very preliminary, um, but it sort of demonstrates the opposite of what we would kind of expect. Um, this actually contradicts sort of overall global signatures. Um, this could potentially represent a warmer and or wetter period, highlighting the sort of variability of the Little Ice Age. Um, the key to remember here is that these data represent about a 15 to 20 year time span and are not a single data point. Modern seasonal trends and patterns of salinity in the nearby Charlotte Harbor suggest an onset of summer rainy season results and a decrease of estuarine salinity and so then more negative um, water values. All three archaeological shells record more positive values, recording cool, colder tummer, summer temperatures and or drier summers than modern shell values record. When the shells are arranged in chronological order, they demonstrate trending more negative or and thus more negative summer values overall uh, indicating increased precipitation during rainy summer seasons and or warmer conditions right so if this was the little ice age we should be expecting colder summer temperatures and or drier summers but what these date what these three shells suggest um, is that we might have um, some different trends happening here more data is needed but it demonstrates again the need for more localized data sets and more than three shells um, that sort of spans the entirety of the Little Ice Age. So what can all of this, um, you know, what does all this mean? Um, I argue here really that Calusa lifeways are clearly very highly in tune with these local ecosystems and integrated them into multiple socioeconomic and sociopolitical institutions at both Pineland and Mount Key. And so, I combine several approaches to understanding the local ecological conditions related to trends in global climate change, the complexities of Calusa subsistence practices, and the ties between changing local ecologies and Calusa economies during the Little Ice Age. Unique deposits at Pineland, considered within a high resolution Bayesian radiocarbon chronology, provide a collection of invertebrate species within which we see changing local conditions to those of lower salinity which would have influenced the location and availability of species within proximity to the site. The various engineering projects at both of these sites were likely used as a way to buffer against environmental variations and support complex social, political, and economic institutions. Ultimately, they're able to foster resiliency in the face of shifting ecological conditions. And so despite the environmental, environmental variability of this period, they're able to transform their traditions of resource use and adopt new ones that likely supported increasingly complex sociopolitical and socioeconomic institutions that then culminated in the form witnessed by Spanish colonizers in the 16th century. And so much of this works is, is work is thanks to um, a very large number of mentors and team um, funded by um, a senior collaborative research grant, National Science Foundation, UGA Graduate School, um, many individuals from the Florida Museum, um, Department of Anthropology at the UGA, Center for Applied Isotope Studies at Georgia, Flagler College, Randall Research Center, numerous volunteers and um, field and lab volunteers involved as well. And so I am happy to take any questions at this point. Awesome, thank you so much, Isabel. Um, Awesome research, super cool finds. So um, yes, if anyone would like to ask a question, feel free to type them away. I think it's easier than the chaos of unmuting and stuff. Um, we have a question coming in from Chris Kayatifis, who says, can I get the MNI again? <laughs> that number you love. <laughs> About 19,000 individual invertebrate species. Uh, um, invertebrate individuals, um, so many tiny shells. Um, my eyes hurt for days at a time, um, just sorting shell. So, um, great palynologist, please give me big <laughs> numbers. Um, yeah, so I'll talk more Rachel about furfish. Um, I believe I should have. Yes. Okay. Um, burfish are um, a species of fish within the Tetradontiformes order, um, Diodontidae family. 
They have a parrot-like beak. Um, they're full of spines. They can puff up as a defense um, and actually contain a toxin called tetrodotoxin, which is commonly referred to um, as a delicacy called fugu. Many of the smooth puffers, which are not part of the diadon today family, but are part of um, a different family also contain this toxin. And so that's that, that Japanese delicacy. Um, and so if not prepared correctly, it can kill a human within a couple hours. Um, these fish also contain this toxin. Um, they're pretty commonly found in another in, in archaeological sites, but usually in very low numbers. Um, however, here at Mount Key, I have in the hundreds of individual fish that are only represented by their um, these dental plates. Um, and so these are our modified teeth. Their, their teeth are basically all fused together. Um, they feed on, on crustaceans and vertebrates, sometimes algae. Um, but they have numerous, numerous dermal spines. And so if we go back. Um, depending on the size of the fish, these could reach upwards to 200 to 400 spines per individual. Um, in all of the deposits at Mount Key, the dental plates are the only thing that I found. Um, and this is not for lack of looking or lack of trying. I went back through everything to try to identify any spines, um, but they're not there. I don't know why this is a fish, a fish with very low meat yield. Um, this is a fish that potentially contains a very, a very toxic substance and and this the species that we have here do have recorded instances of this toxin being present in a number of different um types of of body parts um skin gonads liver um intestines and so i don't know what's going on um i have been trying to data mine for other sites um to see if we have any other very very high numbers um so if anyone has you know, or knows of any other sites that have um, sort of NISP and MNI that rival these numbers, please let me know. Um, you know, we have, there are sites in, in Latin America that have, you know, a few thousand spines and that's the only, um, only element represented. But in the, in the Southeast, this is, this is a little weird. So um, we are still working, I'm still working on figuring out what exactly this means. Um, but we do have a, a very high, very odd number of burfish um, in these deposits. So um, I love talking about them. And so if anyone else wants to and has other data, please let me know. Um, and so I can, I can move on to other questions. Um, do you have evidence of the Calusa going offshore for fish and or aquatic mammals? Um, yes. I mean, we have abundant shark, um, shark vertebra, teeth things like that. Um, we do have very, you know, there are a lot of fish that are, are marine, marine fish, um, aquatic mammals. No, not so much. Um, we have a few dolphin remains, but at, at Pineland, but primarily no. Um, and the reasons for that could be any number of reasons of which I'm not going to speculate on. Um, we do have at Pineland also um, one of the extant species of seal, but again, this monk seal, but again, it's not something that is common by any means in, in, any, in any records. Um, usually when you have uh, marine mammals in, in archeological deposits across the US Southeast, it's normally um, sort of explained as opportunistic har harvesting of, of beached whales or things like that. Not necessarily something that is, um, you know, actively sought after. So, yep. Um, could the burfish have been harvested for the poison? Maybe. Um, there are um, other accounts in the Caribbean of the tetrodotoxin um, being used in voodoo and practices. Um, so potentially, do I have ev any evidence for that? No. Um, I think that, you know, we would have to do 
more empirical evidence and sort of direct testing to do that, what that would look like, I'm, I just don't know yet. Um, potentially, yes. Um, I do. Have, there are accounts of of people using the toxin as a um, sort of a psychoactive, but that is very few and far between um, the records of that. Usually, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty deadly toxin that can kill you pretty quickly. Um, so potentially, but I'm not. I can't say anything very definitively. Um, so yeah, uh, any manatee remains. Um, it's very few and far between. Again, um, you know, not no is is essentially the answer. There's so few that that you could really say no to no manatee. Yeah, which in other parts of the world, um, for example, in Australia, very manatee dugong are very very commonly hunted um, and incorporated into lots of different hunting practices and and lots of different things, but. That's not the case in case for the Calusa in southwestern Florida. Okay, and then Rachel has another fantastic question. Um, do you see your research overlapping with our current issues in climate change? Any lessons we should take away? Um, absolutely. Um, we actually, my colleagues um, at the University of Georgia and the Florida Museum of Natural History, um, we are waiting to hear on some funding to actually um, assess the damage from Hurricane Ian to Mount Key, Pineland, Calusa Island, and Mound House. Um, and so as sort of increasing, you know, direct sort of impacts of increasingly, you know, bad storms and sea level rise, we are seeing um, the destruction and of these sites. And so we are working closely to monitor um, the impacts of these. Um, and you know, even though we have very sort of high variability in the climate records, um, you know, some of this work can really demonstrate that, yeah, we might see a lot of variability and changing and changing trends in the past, but it's nothing like what we're experiencing today. Um, and so seeing how people have sort of dealt with things in the past can potentially contribute to how we move forward. But again, that's a very tenuous, tenuous sort of line to argue because we've never sort of experienced, we as a people on planet earth have never experienced the kinds of things that, um, that we are set to experience. Um, so what, you know, really looking at sort of cultural heritage and how we can minimize the most damage as, as we moving forward, um, based on, based on tribal input as well. And, and what we would like to do with them and what they would like to see. Um, so what you should take away is that people really have been living in these environments for a very long time and very successfully. Um, but, you know, it'll be hard moving forward for sure. So I hope that answered your question, Rachel. I can go back here again. Um, if nobody has any more questions, again, I'm happy to, to field any more. Or if you um, want to email me later, um, I'm happy to, to field questions that way as well. So. Yeah, just to echo everyone in the chat, thank you again um, for your great presentation. And yeah, if anyone wants to email her, um, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop recording real quick. <laughs>